Welcome to this introduction of mass spectrometry analysis. In this lecture, I will briefly summarize some applications of mass spectrometry and the history of the field. Uh, furthermore, I will outline some of the fundamental principles used to identify the chemical composition of analytes analyzed by mass spectrometry. In the second lecture of this sequel, I will uh, discuss methods used to quantify the abundance of analytes, both in absolute terms, such as number of molecules or moles from each analyte, or in relative terms, how a particular analyte varies in abundance across a range of different samples. In the third lecture, uh, I will uh, summarize some frequently used methods for exploring data and doing basic analysis such as clustering and gene set enrichment analysis. If you're interested in learning more about advanced applications of mass spectrometry, you can find uh, a number of recorded videos from the URL uh, listed at the bottom right of this slide. The scope of application of mass spectrometry is vast. You shouldn't think of mass spectrometry as being a single method, but rather you should think of it as being uh, an array of distinct methods that are related by their reliance on measurements of mass overcharge ratios to determine the composition and quantity of analytes. Any substance that can, be anal that can be ionized can be analyzed by mass spectrometry. This, of course, includes gases. And in fact, the first type of analytes to be analyzed by mass spectrometry were atomic gases, subsequently uh, relatively small uh, molecules and molecular gases, and, and so on. Uh, petroleum is analyzed by mass spectrometry to determine its origin, composition, and so on, as well as petroleum products. Uh, mass spectrometry is very widely used in pharmacology. It is frequently the method of choice for determining the uh, purity of, of drugs. Metabolites can be analyzed by mass spectrometry, and not only their chemical composition and abundance, but also metabolic fluxes. The rates by which metabolites are interconverted into living systems can be measured directly by mass spectrometry using uh, just mass conservation and, and metabolic and uh, isotopically labeled compounds. Nucleotides and nucleic acids can be analyzed by mass spectrometry, usually they're analyzed with mass spectrometry when we're interested in their modifications. That is not merely the sequence of a nucleic acid, but covalent modifications to nucleotides, such as methylation uh, and the pseudouridination and other modifications can be, uh, can be analyzed directly with mass spectrometry. And I'll provide an example of, of such analysis on the next slide. Mass spectrometry is the most powerful method for analyzing proteins, their modifications, such as phosphorylation and glycosylation, and their interactions, such as the binding, of the, the, the binding between proteins to form protein complexes. Because proteins are large macromolecules that don't ionize very easily, it is frequently convenient to start by digesting them into peptides and then analyzing the peptides by mass spectrometry, something uh, of which I'm going to give more examples later in the course of these lectures. Uh, let me start with an example of analyzing a modification of the 16S ribosomal RNA. Because RNA molecules don't ionize easily, in this case, the RNA is digested to nucleotides. The nucleotides are then ionized, and when injected into the mass spec instrument, one can detect a number of distinct peaks with the 
and master charge ratios indicated here on the x-axis. Measuring the master charge ratios in this case and in many other cases is not sufficient to determine the composition of these, of these ions and the corresponding molecules and therefore one has to isolate a particular uh, ion of interest fragment it and upon analysis of the fragments determine the composition of the molecule and in this case the peak at 817 Thomson, Thomson is the unit in which we measure uh, mass to charge ratios, it's Dalton's overcharge, uh, so the peak at uh, 817 Thomson is isolated and further fragmented resulting in the MS2 spectrum shown at the bottom, which is used then to determine that this nucleotide is methylated and the exact position of the methylation. The history of mass spectrometry starts with the famous measurement of the mass to charge ratio of the electron by J.J. Thompson in 1989, for which of course he received the Nobel Prize. J.J. Thompson had another important contribution to the field. In particular, he was the first investigator to measure difference in the atomic weight of different isotopes, in this case of neon. He was able to identify and, care and document the presence of neon 20 and neon 22. His student, Francis Aston, built the first functional mass spec instrument and used it to analyze uh, further um, atomic gases such as chlorine and other simple compounds and he identified additional isotopes. So we can see that from the very beginning of mass spectrometry um, isotopes played an important role not only that they were discovered by mass spectrometry but you'll see that isotopes and their patterns are used in the way we analyze and understand mass spectrometry data. Uh, and they can also be used to increase the multiplexing capabilities of mass spectrometry, something of which uh, we are going, something that we are going to discuss in the second lecture. Another important milestone in the development of mass spectrometry was the introduction of the cyclotron by Ernest Lawrence. Uh, initially, uh, Ernest Lawrence built a small instrument and then he kept building larger and larger and more powerful instruments. The cyclotron is something that you're perhaps familiar from your uh, physics classes in, in high school. It's uh, a Fourier transform mass spec instrument, which means that the measurements are, uh, are made based on the induced current of ions that move in closed trajectories. And then by applying Fourier analysis on, on, those in, on the induced current, one can uh, deduce what the mass overcharge ratio is, and one can do this measurement with very high accuracy. To this day, cyclotrons remain the most accurate uh, instruments used for measuring uh, mass to charge ratio, uh, but they're not always very practical because the requirement of uh, superconducting magnets and very large and very expensive installations. Ernest Lawrence was very, uh, very capable, not only technically in developing this technology, but also in raising resources and building uh, the first uh, accelerators uh, to, to investigate um, subatomic particles. He also used this technology for the first biomedical applications, such as the isolation of radioactive isotope of phosphorus that were used for cancer research and treatment. Throughout the rest of the 20th century, mass spectrometry continued developing, but it had a substantial limitation in terms of its applicability to biomedical research and to analyzing biological molecules because biological molecules are large and complex, they don't easily ionize, uh, 
and many of the methods used for ionization resulted in substantial fragmentation of macromolecules. And this difficulty was mitigated by the invention of the um, electrospray ionization by John Fenn in mid 1980s. Uh, this is a method that uses very high voltage, usually thousands of volts, uh, to convert um, a liquid medium into a fine aerosol, and then from that ionize the analytes so that they can enter the mass spectrometer in the form of ions. Another very important ionization method that can be used for biological molecules was developed at about the same time, and that is known as MOLDI, Matrix Assisted Laser Desorption um, Ionization. Another important event that uh, occurred at the beginning of our century was the introduction of orbitrap mass detectors. Similar to the cyclotron, orbitraps are Fourier transform instruments, meaning that they measure induced current, and from that, you, uh, by doing reverse Fourier transform, uh, can estimate the mass to charge ratio. Uh, these instruments, as the name suggests, orbitrap, trap ions that are turning in orbits. They use electrostatic field to trap uh, orbiting ions, and, the, and uh, a substantial advantage of orbitraps compared to cyclotrons is that they can be made much smaller and much cheaper because they don't require the very large magnetic fields, so rather they use electrostatic potential to to get the ions to, to, um, to cycle. Uh, and this technology was further developed by Thermo Scientific and continues to, uh, to be widely used. Uh, another very important mass detector that allows measuring mass to charge ratio with high accuracy is known as time of flight or TOF instrument. And there are additional mass detectors. This history that I'm providing here, the overview is clearly not intended to be exhaustive, um, simply highlighting a few important milestones. So if you have a very pure isolated compound, such as a peptide, and you run this through a liquid chromatography, then ionize it and inject it into the mass spec instrument, you may be surprised that instead of seeing a single peak, you're going to see a series of peaks that are offset by a specific amount in M over Z space, as shown here. The reason for that is the presence of isotopes. So each molecule might be made of different isotopes, uh, and the probability of the presence of additional neutrons in each molecule can be computed from the binomial distribution by knowing what is the isotopic abundance of each atom in nature. And uh, once you do this computation, you can find that uh, there is a relatively high probability that each molecule contains an additional neutron, contains at least one heavy isotope, and then there is a probability that each molecule contains two or three additional isotopes and so on. And these additional, uh, these additional neutrons that are present or the isotopes that are present in the molecules result in the series of peaks. These peaks are actually quite useful for determining the charge of the ions. Because remember, mass spec instruments don't measure mass they measure mass over charge. And if we want to know the mass, we have to determine the charge. Because we know that two neighboring peaks are separated by a single neutron, one Dalton, then the distance between them is going to be equal to one over the charge. So if the distance is uh, one over two, then the charge is two. If the distance is one over four, then the charge is four. So by looking at the isotopic pattern of 
a molecule, or we can determine what is the charge of its corresponding ion. Now, suppose that we measured the mass of that peptide with very, very high accuracy. For example, the peptide is as indicated here, peptide STRG with the corresponding empirical formula. So from the very high accuracy mass measurement, we might be able to determine the empirical formula, but we certainly cannot determine the chemical composition of that peptide. For one thing, the amino acids can be permuted, leaving the empirical formula and the mass the same, but corresponding to a different peptide sequence. So if we want to determine the chemical composition, in this case, the sequence of the peptide, we normally have to further fragment the peptide and detect the fragments. There are a variety of methods for doing such fragmentation. In this case, here to the right, I'm displaying a panel from a review article by John Yates, outlining three different methods uh, for uh, fragmenting peptides. These methods tend to fragment peptides at distinct places in the peptide backbone, as indicated here on the top. And from the corresponding fragments, we can determine what the sequence of the peptide is, as also indicated on this slide. Uh, each uh, fragment that we can match might correspond to a pair of amino acids linked together, three, four, or more amino acids. And using these data, we may either uh, determine the peptide sequence de novo, meaning that without any pre-existing information, we can determine what the peptide is, or sometimes we may not have enough peptide fragments for that, but using knowledge uh, for uh, the proteins encoded in the genome, we might be able to determine uh, the, the peptide sequence, which is commonly done. Uh, we'll discuss this in more details in the third class of this uh, series of lectures. So it gave you some idea how to analyze a single peptide, but of course you would be interested not in analyzing a single peptide, but in analyzing hundreds of thousands of peptides and millions of peptides. And the way to achieve that is by uh, separating complex mixtures in time, usually by liquid chromatography or by capillary electrophoresis, so that at any point in time, instead of uh, injecting all of the millions of peptides into the mass spec instrument, uh, you have a smaller number of peptides uh, eluting from the column and uh, ionizing and entering the instrument. As you can see in the ion map shown to the left, over time the instrument, at each instant in time, the instrument can see a large number of ions and to determine their chemical composition and abundance, usually we have to isolate them, fragment them one by one, and do that many times. So the more you can stretch out the elution of peptides in time, the more time you're going to have to isolate individual peptides and analyze the more groups of peptides. There are also methods that allow isolating groups of peptide and peptides and analyzing them simultaneously. Uh, and, uh, and therefore one might begin to analyze on the order of tens or hundreds of thousands of peptides per sample. As I said from the very beginning, Mass spectrometry is not a single method, but a very large collection of methods, even when applied just to proteins and, and peptides. So there are many different variations of the method that is outlined in this slide, but they share similar principles that in general, we want to separate the analytes in time, um, usually done by chromatography, and then uh, analyze a smaller subsets of the analyzed at a time so that we can determine their chemical composition. So with that, I'll conclude the first uh, lecture on identifying the chemical composition of analytes by mass spectrometry and the short history of the field. Uh, if you're interested uh, in learning more about quantification, data analysis,
uh, you can find the subsequent lectures that are part of the same uh, playlist. And if you have questions, you can leave them uh, below the playlist and I'll try to answer as many questions as I can.